The title of today's message is Follow Me, and I'm really excited just to dive right into the text and not do a super long intro today. But before we um, start, I want to make it clear that when I say follow me, I'm speaking on behalf of Jesus. I don't really mean follow me, I mean follow him. And I also want to make it clear that today's scripture, today's text, the passage that we're reading from the book of John was not written by John, first and foremost, to be a historical account for us to le- read about and to learn about. The Gospel of John, as we mentioned in the first um, message from the series, and perhaps the second, the Gospel of John was written very, very much for us to have an experience through the Scriptures. And, and as we often say from Hebrews, God's Word, it's living and active. It's, uh, it's alive. It leaps off the page at you. We don't just read it. It reads us. And it is my prayer, it has been my prayer all week for us to read this, um, to talk about it, for me to preach it almost as a sacrament, and for you to receive it and to be so blessed by it and so, um, for it to be so experiential that for many of us it would set us in motion in our walk with Jesus Christ. Some of us have never followed Jesus. And this might be the day that we decide that we're going to go from a belief system to a relationship. I, I love the lyrics on the song, how it, how it says, I believe and I will follow Jesus. It's not just I believe, it's I believe and I will follow Jesus. I think the one thing about the Christian faith that sets it apart from all others is it's not just about what we believe. It's not a doctrine. It's not an unknown God we're trying to ascend to. It is a God that descends to us through his Son and by the power of the Holy Spirit and beckons us into a relationship even right here and right now. And so I'm praying that today, many of us who have never begun a journey with Jesus Christ, we may have appeared to, we may have done a head fake towards it once or twice, but some of us who have never truly been walking with our Savior will feel empowered to do so today. My prayer is that some of us who have walked with Jesus and maybe have strayed or stopped in our journey with Him or found other things more important will be re-inspired by his kindness today to hear his voice and to kind of recommit ourselves to him and to seeking him and to following him as well. And it is my prayer today as well, um, not just for the individuals of this body, but that Jesus would use this message to set this entire church in motion. And and honestly, I know some of us are in motion, and we're hearing God, and we're following God, but we kind of haven't hit that point yet, uh, that point of inflection, where we really are a community following hard after God. And you know what? That takes time, and it takes patience, and we're not necessarily off schedule, but it is my hope today that, that, that we would not hear Pastor Brian's voice, or John's voice even, but that we would hear the voice of Jesus saying to each of us, follow me and that we would marvel as the Holy Spirit orchestrated a movement for him. And so the good news is that this is good news. Uh, following him is not a bad thing. It is a very good thing. And we're going to talk about how good that is, not just for him and his kingdom and for others, but for all of us. We're going to talk about that today. And we're going to make sure that we know that God is good and that his will is good and that following him is good. And not only is it good, here's what I would, here's what I would have you go away with today. To hear and to know the voice of God and to follow him is not just good, it is best. It is good to the exclusion of anything or anyone else. He is the source of every good and perfect gift. And whatever his will is, even though it might not exalt my ego or exalt my um, fleshly desires, is truly the best thing for me and for my family. And so I pray with all my might that God would hear me and that we would hear him, and that today's text would set us in motion. With that said, let's dive right in. We're in John chapter 1, and we're in the last section of the first chapter, and we're going to pick it up in uh, verse 35. Uh, The beginning was was, was the section where God, where John basically talked about how in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Basically, he was deifying Christ, letting us know that this wasn't just a son of man, who is greatly exalted and anointed. This was the Son of God. The second section was, uh, we were introduced to the ministry of John the Baptist, which preceded the ministry of Jesus. He was the herald to prepare hearts to receive Christ. And then today, we're in the third section, where Jesus actually um, doesn't begin his public ministry, but begins to build his team uh, and, and call people to follow him so that he can begin his public ministry 
which begins in chapter 2. In verse 35, this section begins like this. It says, the next day, John, this was after John recognized Jesus, called him the Lamb of God, and let everybody know that that's the one that you ultimately are going to want to follow. The next day, John was, was there with two of his disciples, and when he saw Jesus, you could say again, passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Now, the two disciples that were with him are about to leave John and begin to follow Jesus. They're going to follow him even though they didn't uh, audibly hear the words to follow me. That would come a little bit later. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to stop right here and slow down and pause and talk about the goodness of God. We did this a little bit last week, but I think this is a point that I often pass over too quickly. And in doing so, I, don't, I think many are lost at that moment. And, and like I said last week, I, I come to this assumption that, that uh, you all want the presence of God in your life when the truth of the matter is I don't even always want the presence of God in my life, right? I mean, light has come into darkness and, you know, darkness didn't like the light because our deeds were evil and we didn't want to come into the light for fear that our deeds would be exposed. Not only that, he's going to make us do stuff we don't want to do. He's going to try to make us change. Like, I don't want any of that. So let's stop for a minute and consider the goodness of God. Clearly, the, these disciples of John had been hanging around him a lot. And they had been speaking primarily, we know from John's language, that he was always focusing ahead on the Messiah. So clearly, they had been talking a lot about the Messiah, about this Jesus, and what his ministry would be like. And clearly, from the response that we're about to see from these two, they were ready, and they were excited, and they were leaning in um, for the call. And it was only, I can only imagine that the reason they felt that way is that they knew that God was good and that his will was good. They knew that this Messiah came um, to bring life and life more abundantly. I don't know what language they would have used, but they, they had to have a sense from the teaching from John that he was good. Now, what, what I would say today is that regardless of who we are in this room and what our exposure has been to church and teaching and the Bible and all of these things, I would presume today that, that most of us have had enough exposure in our culture to the scriptures to have some indication, at least from, you know, zealots like me, that Jesus is good and it is good to follow him. Now, we may not believe it, but, but we do have that knowledge. And many of us have been prepared like these disciples were being prepared for when that moment comes, for when Christ calls us to respond John Wesley would have called this prevenient grace, the grace of God that comes um, before we're even aware of it. It is the grace of God that woos us to him, that lulls us into a relationship with him. It is the grace of God that seeks us. Often uh, in churches, we, we, you know, our Christianese would say, we need, to, we need to reach more seekers. We need to find the seekers out there. But the truth of the matter is, there is no one who seeks God apart from God seeking them. The scriptures teach us in the Old Testament that, that God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they looked down on men after the fall, and they, and they were looking for anyone who was seeking him, anyone who was teaching from him, anyone who was even talking about him, and not one was really turned towards him apart from his intervention. Uh, we, were, we had all gone our own ways. We were all left over to our own devices, and, and God was appalled by that. So his own right hand, his son, who sits at his right hand, was sent from heaven to earth to intervene and to intercede, to seek us. He was, he was appalled, and so he worked salvation for himself. And so a, as you come in here today, I imagine through prayer, and, and I feel like what God is saying to me is, regardless of where they are, Brian, I want you to know that I've been seeking them. And, and that's why they're here today. They may think they're here for some natural reason, because a friend invited them, or you know, they just go to church out of religious muscle memory, or they just saw the sign randomly, or whatever reason. But the truth of the matter is, I really believe today that if you're here, you've been drawn here by the Holy Spirit. And if you will open yourself up to that, he is ready to speak to you. And if you're holding on to some doubts and some fears and things such as that, he wants you to know that his grace is even sufficient for that. And he told this pastor today to slow down again a second week and to talk about his goodness because he knows how important that is to setting you in motion. I went to Luke chapter 2 and I pulled out a passage so that we could talk about this a little bit before we moved on with the passage that we're really teaching from. And this is a very familiar um, few verses from Luke chapter 2. And this is what the 
the angels came to, an angel came to the shepherds who were tending their field when Jesus was born, and they kind of heralded, they prophesied the coming of this Messiah who was at that moment being born or about to be born. And then a great um, host of angels came around them at the end and created one more phrase. And, and you probably recognize this, even if you only go to church at you know, Christmas and Easter, this is one of, the, one of our all-time favorites, just right there with John 3.16. And you don't, some of you don't even know what John 3.16 says. You just know that we really like it because you see it at all the football games. But nonetheless, this is, this is one of the, the great verses of all time. But I want to make it relevant and alive for you today and not just some religious jargon. The angel said to the shepherds, by the way, the shepherds were not the elite. They were not the most spiritual. They were actually kind of the lower class in their culture. And it was incredibly ironic that the most great God would humble himself, be born into straw poverty, and announce his coming not to kings and not to even the religious elite, but to shepherds working a field. That was an indication of his mode of operation. But anyway, the angel said to the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news, not bad news, that will cause great joy for all the people. Today a Savior has been born to you, not, not a judger, um, not an uber-critical person, not a condemner, maybe a convictor, but a savior, someone to save you. Not just to save you eternally, but to save you on earth as it shall be in heaven. Uh, that would have been their expectation of a savior in that day, in that time, in that culture. Um, in the vestiges of the theocracy of Israel, when the Messiah came, he will be a savior to us. He will reestablish us. He will, he will bring us life. He, he's not coming to do bad for his people. He's coming to do good. And yes, he will fight against the enemies of his people, but his people can be any people that just receive him and know who he is and believe that he is good and respond to that. So a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He's not just a Savior. He has great authority. And by, if you think about it, how could you have a Savior who had no power, right? Like if you're out of money, and, and you have a guy that's really Christ-like who's a friend of yours, and you go see him, and he has all the compassion in the world, and he prays for you, and he gives you a hug and a kiss, but he's as broke as you are. It, what, like, what a good is that, right? So you didn't just go to a toothless Savior who just had compassion on you and would pet you kind of like a little sheep, like in those pictures, which I don't think, I don't know if Jesus ever really did that, but whatever. And you went to a king who had authority, who had power, he, he wasn't one who would pray for you. He was the one you prayed to. He pulled out his wallet and he said, how much do you need? Well, he never has really said that to me, but, you know, theoretically, he does that. So he had power. He wasn't, he wasn't toothless. He was, a, he was a savior. He was a Messiah, and he was Lord. And so today, what I would say to you is don't underestimate his coming. Don't underestimate his coming in this scene. Don't es underestimate his coming in your scene today. This may be the moment that everything turns around. If your life is in the ditch, don't underestimate this. When Jesus says, follow me, everything else hangs in the balance. His will is good. It is pleasing. It is powerful. It may not be what you think you want, but it is the highest, best good for you. It may not be mostly about you. It may be about someone else. It may be seeking him or someone else or the needs of others first. But I can assure you that when you seek first the kingdom of God, all of your needs are added as well. And when God blesses, he adds no trouble to it. It's not a counterfeit. It's the real thing. And that is, that is what this angel is trying to get through to these shepherds. This is not bad news. This is good news. When he grows up and, against, and he begins to speak and he begins to act, I strongly suggest that you respond because his intention is all good. His will for you is good. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel and praising God, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And I think this most recent version of the, the NIV may have mutilated the power of this verse 38, but I'm going to read it anyway, and then I'm going to rephrase it in maybe more of like the King James language or the early NIV, and then I'm going to give you the Brian James, um, you know, version of it, which is probably blasphemous, so just please forgive me. But anyway, <laughs> suddenly a great company of heaven, heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. Uh, glory to God in the highest heaven. Glory to God above all spiritual things, all material things, all things. This Savior is a king. This Savior is not just a Lord. He's the Lord. This guy has power. This is a very, very powerful man. This is the, most, this is the power that spoke the, the universe into existence. Wow. Glory, praise, and honor to him in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace 
on, to those on whom his favor rests. Now, that just sounds like uh, peace to those who, who he's okay with. Uh, the version you might be more familiar with from Christmas is peace on earth and goodwill to men. Um, but even that, to me, kind of loses the power of it. What I would say is peace to those for whom he has great plans. I think what, what the angels were saying is, uh, is glory to God in the highest. Obviously, that's a great way to start a prayer. And then he was saying peace to you, he, uh, even though he's powerful, even though he's strong, even though he's holy, even though he's righteous and you're not. Uh, we want you to know that he comes in peace. And, and, and he's very, very good, but let's not just stop there. Uh, not just peace on earth, but goodwill to men. Goodwill for you. He has goodwill for you. Uh, that doesn't just mean he's going to pat you on the back and say, I, I'm just in a good mood towards you. It means he has a good plan for you. Um, goodwill and good intentions towards you. And he didn't come from heaven to earth to administer his goodwill for you and for all who would follow him passively or impersonally he came to deliver it personally and specifically and precisely he came to bring salvation to creation by reconnecting it to him their creator and giving them the capacity once again even though they're smart and even though they have pretty good ideas and instincts we were never meant to exist apart from the counsel and the spirit of God and so he's saying he's coming again to reattach you to your creator who is good from whom is every good and perfect gift who has this wonderful will who is who is being introduced as the lamb to pass over your sins that you might receive these blessings Rather than the, the one who will come again, when we've, for those who have rejected it, it will be a very bad day. This is a very good day. This is very, very good news. And so what I would say to you, church, is that, that this coming in Luke 2 and this coming in John 1 wasn't just for them then. It was recorded by the apostles as they wrote the scripture as they were being carried along by the Holy Spirit, so that we might read it and we might experience it right here, right now, today. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus died on the cross for the joy set before him, and, and it was scene after scene, moment after moment like this in churches, where people would get into the Word, and, their, and the scales would fall from their eyes, and they would see that Jesus is good, and, and that his plans are good. And, you know... Uh, the scripture says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and I believe that that is absolutely true. Many times I, I, I smarten up when I fear that I'm out of the will of God and things aren't going so well because I'm not doing so good. The, the fear of the Lord may be the beginning of wisdom, but what I would say is that the love of God and being convinced of his love of us is what completes it. About nine years ago when Elaine and I went from uh, Atlanta to California, and even less than a year ago, a few months ago, when we came from California to here, these big, huge, expensive, scary, ominous moves. I would say the thing that really set us in motion both times, uh, what set me in motion to marry Elaine when God brought her into my life, what set me in motion to go to seminary, what set us in motion to go plant our first church, what set us in motion to plant this church and ultimately move here, it was never that we were convinced um, that, that God was in it, and this was his plan, and it was the greatest thing for his glory and his kingdom. I mean, we were always convinced of that. That, that came very quickly and early on, but the thing that really would set us in motion would be being convinced about his goodwill for us. So probably our biggest leap of faith as a couple in our entire relationship was the going from Atlanta to California. As big as this was, that was like that was uncharted territory. Like we, everybody thought we were crazy, except for about three people. And when we were in that moment, we became convinced that a church was needed in California. We became convinced that a church was needed in this community. We were convinced that I was called to do it, and we were convinced she was called to be my wife and, and be in that role with this, and we were just absolutely convinced about all the good kingdom reasons to do it. But it wasn't until we were convinced that not only was it good for us, but it was the best thing for us and our family did we really get set in motion. Our, our life verse in that time was Jeremiah 29, 11 that says, um, I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and not to harm you. And in context of that, it says, you will, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. 
and you will find these plans. And, and that's where God was leading us. Those were the plans that he had for us. Well, we were holding on to verses at that time that said things like, no one has given up houses and fields and brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers who will fail to receive many times more in this age and in the age to come. We were holding on to things like in Hebrews where it says that, that you know, anyone who comes to God must believe he exists. And it says, if you read between the lines, that he is good and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It was those kind of verses, and God personally applying them to our heart, that set us in motion. I'll never forget right before it was time to make, you know, the the final preparations where there was no turning back. I was driving down the road in my car one day, and and the Holy Spirit was there with me, and I don't even think I was listening to Christian music, if you can believe it, and he came to me, and and I was experiencing his love and his presence. And I know some of you have had big experiences with that, and some of you might struggle to even believe that really exists. I want you to know that it does. I don't like to make things up, except when I do. And this was a real experience that I was having. And, and, I was, and, and it was dis- despite our current circumstances and our, our life being so, you know, in turmoil because of preparing to move, and the presence of God came in, and he gave me boldness, and he gave me confidence, and he made me sure-footed, and he gave me clarity. And, I mean, I was just experiencing all of this presence of God. And, and in the midst of that, he helped me to realize that there was nothing better that I, that I could leave to my children than for them to have a relationship intimately with him like that. And, and so I began to realize I could leave them millions of dollars, and they would just turn it into drugs and trouble if they didn't have character to contain it. I could give them the greatest education in the world, and they could just become arrogant and godless in the pursuit of higher intelligence. There is nothing I could give them um, better or more important than Jesus. And in that moment, the Lord said, well, this, this is how you get this. You get this by following me. And, and, and if you want your kids to follow me, then you have to lead them as I've led you. You can't fake it. You can talk about it. You can take them to church every single week. You can quote scripture, but your actions speak louder than your words. The very best thing for them is to be in this kind of relationship with me. If you want to pass that on to them, then the best way you can do that, they will have to make their own choices, is to demonstrate it. And the best way to demonstrate it is to pick up your cross and follow me. Because this isn't just a good plan for you. This isn't just a plausible plan for you for you. This is the plan for you. This isn't just good, it's best. And before we go on in this scripture, I just want you to know today, if you just have a mustard seed of faith that that is true, that that God's grace is sufficient, that the lamb who took away the sins of the world didn't just take away the sins of the world, but took away yours, and that he has come and he has cleansed you by his blood so that he can send his Holy Spirit and not just administer his goodness and his grace in the sense of, you know, eternal pardon, which is good enough for itself, but also administer his grace by administering his goodwill into your life, then if you just believe that a little more than you don't, you might be ready to follow him. It might be time to heed his voice. And begin to unpack incrementally what it means, not just to talk about Jesus, not just to have knowledge about Jesus, but to know him, to hear him, and to follow him. Now moving back into our passage, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Now go back where we were when they heard John say, there's the Lamb of God that we've been talking about, they followed Jesus. If we we read this uh, word followed in the Greek, we would realize that it's, it's a very big binding word. They didn't just follow him kind of to stalk him or to see what he was doing or where he was going. That's what it's going to appear like. But the word followed here meant they left their, their one leader, they left their one um, culture and nucleus, and they entered into another. They were convinced already. They were ready. They had decided to follow Jesus. Now, their, their minds hadn't caught up with their hearts. They didn't have all the theology around it, right? That didn't actually come all the way until Pentecost in some ways. So they weren't all the way there yet. They were a work in process. They didn't understand everything yet, but they were convinced enough that they knew that it was worth it to begin to follow him. So they began to follow him. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked. Jesus was so provocative. He just really not a seeker-sensitive guy at all. He said, what do you want? (laughs) <laughs> can you imagine I mean that's crazy I do that with my kids by the way if all what do you want but I think with Jesus it was like this I really do believe this I think he turned around and I think he looked through them and, and he I think it was I think it was a call to commitment you better know what you're doing 
I'm a very powerful man. I'm a very radical man. I'm, just not, I'm not just a man. I'm not just the son of man. I'm the son of God. I'm about transcendence. This is intense. This is real. Like, wh- what do you want? Do you want this? Because this is the real deal, and it's good, and you should want it, but do you know what you want? Jesus says in other passages, you better count the cost. This is a big deal. If you want the best, there is a cost. And, and I'm telling you, I'm in a mode right now where I really want you to receive Jesus, and I'm tempted to water it down a little bit, but i got to tell you the truth. If you want it, there's, there's a cost. But it's worth it. The voice of God, his leadership, the Holy Spirit, his best plans for you, they're the pearl of great price. And as the scripture says, though it costs you everything, buy it. So there's a cost. Now, we all have what it costs. It costs whatever we have, and it costs all of what we have. But good news, we have it. And good news, it's worth it. But that is a transaction of faith. We receive grace by faith. He doesn't just throw it on us indiscriminately whether we receive it or not. We receive grace by faith. It's not by works, but it is by, but it, but it is by faith. And as James will teach us later, faith without action is dead. And so Jesus, I really think he's like, I'm a bad man. You better know what you want. So they answer about like I would really weakly. They said rabbi, which means teacher. By the way, not incidentally, this shows us that John was very much interested in reaching a non-Hebrew audience, Gentile and beyond, because he's translating certain words that only Hebrew people would be really familiar with. He wanted us to see, he wanted a Gentile audience to see, even 2,000 years later, uh, that rabbi meant teacher. And more important than that, that this was good news not just for uh, Israel, Um, per se, but for spiritual Israel, anyone who would give their heart to God. They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? What a lame response. And so he he was fine. Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw saw where he was staying, and they spent the after... Uh, spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Now we see from this, uh, John saying it was about four in the afternoon. We're going to see that one of the two disciples was Andrew, and probably the second one, the only one who would have this knowledge is John. And so John was saying, yeah, it was about four o'clock. And so one of them is me, not going to draw attention to me. Uh, John the Baptist didn't draw attention to himself. I'm not going to draw attention to myself. But he wanted to let us know that he was an eyewitness to these events, and he was even a participant in being called by God. After they spent the afternoon, I mean, I can only imagine, can you imagine spending a day with Jesus, what that would be like, like in his physical presence? And and whatever happened that day, they were only more convinced, and they were the the catalyst, the first two to create the 12, to create, you know, millions and millions, if not billions over time. But can you only imagine what it was like? Whatever it was that they were convinced, they looked into his eyes, and they evidently saw some level of safety, some level of power, some level of intrigue um, and inspiration. They They were fired up after spending the day with Jesus. So Andrew, one of the two, who was Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said about Jesus and had decided to follow Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. Again, defining it for us as if we didn't know what Messiah meant, that Christ would be easier, but whatever. He's trying to help us out. Messiah is the one that the the Hebrew people expected who would bring together the the priesthood and, um, and, and... government authority into one person which would have been hard for other people non-theocratic people to understand but he just said for our benefit he is the anointed one he is the son of god he is the christ he is the one we are waiting on Um, he's the savior and he brought him to jesus jesus looked at him and said this is to peter now who is who is simon at this point he said you are simon son of john and you will be called cephas that's aramaic which is translated uh to peter which is translated to us is as the rock And so these two get fired up. They're hanging out with Jesus, and one of them goes and gets uh, Simon, and Simon comes, and Jesus looks at him, and he doesn't say, if you follow me, this will happen. He doesn't say, um, if you do it just right and and, and you're really faithful over time, then this will happen. He doesn't say anything like that. He speaks prophetically to the man out of his good will, his good heart, as we've been speaking much about, and he says, says, you're going to be a rock. Now, one of the things we're going to learn about Peter as we go through the scriptures is that Peter was really kind of arrogant. 
And, and he was a guy, I mean, I'm sure that, that anybody who's a psychologist or psychiatrist could profile him, and they would see that he was a guy who probably lacked self-esteem, and, and instead of being meek, he overcompensated with bravado, right? I don't know anybody like that, do you? And, and so he was like a football player, but really he was like, uh, in the Wizard of Oz, the lion that needed a heart, right? And so, so Jesus looks at him, and he doesn't criticize him, he doesn't hate him, he looks at him and he loves him. And, he's, and, he, and so his goodwill for Peter, check it out, it's not a big house, it's not bling, it's not a new Mercedes. He doesn't say, you're going to own Walmart. He looks at Peter and says, you're going to be a rock. I'm going to give you a blessing that is so good, I mean, that nothing can stand against it. I'm going to transform you. I'm going to make you into what you really want to be. And, and, and so we begin to get an indication um, that might not be a great selling point, but if, I can't help it. It's in the Bible about the blessing that God has planned for each of us. And it goes back to me in that car with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and what I want for my parents and what I really want for you. I mean, I would love for us to have riches. I would love for us to have fame. But I mean, what is it to gain the world but forfeit your soul? What I really want is for us to have this kind of blessing that Jesus is speaking over Peter to us. Uh, a peace and a joy that is unconditional on circumstances. A peace and joy that is beyond all understanding. Uh, a, a stature um, by being so filled with the presence and the power of God that we can laugh at the days to come, even if everything is falling down around us. A spiritual Prozac and steroids all mixed together with no, no acne. Uh, the, the ability to laugh at the days to come. The Bible says that the righteous, those in a right relationship with God, are as bold as lions beyond all circumstances. And we see that that must be true because one character in the Bible, Old Testament knew, after another stood in the face of incredible persecution and trouble and, and stood firm-footed for God. And, and that's not a character thing that we have in ourselves. It's something that God gives us. And so we see that Jesus and his ultimate blessing and his ultimate goodwill for us, it may be a wife and it may be kids and it may be a great job. I certainly don't want to exclude those things. Those things are in Scripture as well. But the, but the main thing is the character to go along with it. And that is the desire of God for all of us today. He looks in this room and he doesn't see what we think our felt needs are. He sees our heart and he, and he has a plan. And he, lo- and he doesn't criticize us. He loves us. He sees the good mixed with the bad. And, and his plan for us is to transform us, to change us, to make us new from the inside out. And yes, perhaps load us up with stuff, bless us to be a blessing for him, perhaps. But more important than that, to give us a stout heart and strong hands with which to serve him and to enjoy him. After that, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. In all of Scripture, all we can say about Philip is we never hear about him much ever again. He seems to be an incredibly um, unremarkable character. He doesn't seem to have the skills or bring in as much to the table as everybody else. I'm reading between the lines. I don't know for sure. He's not one who went to Jesus. He's one to whom Jesus had to go. And he's one that Jesus had to kind of capture. And some of us with our personality, he plays hard to get, I guess. I don't know. He kind of knows how we are. But others, I think he comes directly to us in our meekness and our weakness and our low self-esteem. He just comes to us. And, and I'm telling you, he played games with the first group. He said, you better want me. He gave a weird prophecy to Peter, and he probably didn't know what to make of that. Like, how am I going to go from being Simon, which is a reed, to a rock? That was, he was probably still puzzled with that, following him to the next guy. And he gets down to Philip, and he doesn't even, it's unvarnished. He just looks at him, and he grabs him, and he says, follow me. And, and, and if we read that and translate that, it, it comes with a connotation that right here, right now. Come here, come now. It is a command. And it's almost like God coming up to a very unremarkable, perhaps a weaker personality and just loving them and saying, you know what, this one is not going to get away. You ever had somebody like that in your life? You're like, I'm just going to grab him. I'm going to put him under my wing. Jesus is like, I'm going to put this one under my wing. I'm just not. I love him, and I just want him. And when, and when Jesus said, follow me, it wasn't because I, you have all these gifts for me to exploit. By the way, that's true for all of us. He said, follow me right here, right now, because I'm going to get you all the way home. I love you too much to leave you. That's his goodwill. 
entering into that man's soul, and my prayer today entering into ours as well. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel and told him. Philip, Nathaniel was his friend. It, it appears that these men were all affected greatly by John the Baptist's um, ministry, which, mean they, which means not only did they have the same messianic expectation as the rest of Israel, they had a sense of its imminence. And so Philip found Nathaniel with this shared expectation that this guy is around here somewhere. We're going to see him any minute. And he says, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. He is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, I love, I love his response. And we don't do a very good job grammatically of setting these quotes apart. So you just got to, we're twisting. It's no longer, um, it's no longer um, Philip speaking. It's Nathaniel speaking back. And he says, uh, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Come and see, said Philip. So it would be like him saying, Warrington? No Messiah comes from Warrington. Or, or probably your response for some of you guests, a shack. Nothing good happens in a shack, right? I mean, it was, it was born in a manger, in a cave, in a barn from a poor family. Like, how can anything significant come from this? And so Nathaniel, he doesn't actually argue with the premise that this one that has been being waited on for history is around. He kind of expects that, but he's like, like surely he ain't from Nazareth. Because that's a thoroughly unremarkable, insignificant town, and there could be no more significant person in the history of the world. And I tell you, don't despise humble beginnings and don't underestimate your, the environment that you're in right now. Just because it's not the biggest building and just because um, it, it may not come with all the fun, fanfare, the Spirit of God is real. The Word of God is powerful. And, and the one thing I know about the character of God, when He calls us, He speaks with a still, silent voice. And He, and he always underpromises and overdelivers. Everything in this world comes with pomp and circumstance, and it overpromises and underdelivers. Jesus Christ comes and He says two words He says, Follow me. Still, silent voice, follow me. It's kind of loud through mine, but you know, on the inside, quiet. And, and those two words are everything to the exclusion of all the other words and all the other lies and all the other messages that have promised so much our entire life, this one, I mean, this is the one that delivers. When we receive him, he says he will never leave us or forsake us. He is our author and our perfecter. He who starts a good work in us will bring it forth to completion. As we say in the benediction, he will absolutely, uh, unequivocally uh, present us before his throne without blemish or fault to live eternally with him. And not only that, he will, he will, there will be ultimate transcendence all the time on earth as it shall be in heaven. I mean, this is the real deal. And so don't underestimate. No smoke and mirrors are needed. This is real. If I didn't have a mic and we didn't have a band and I was standing on the floor with you and we were in a circle and it looked like it did when we moved in here, uh, it would be just as powerful. Those early services, when we preached the word, they were as powerful as they are right now. If one day God gives us a cathedral and we have all fancy lights and all kinds of trappings, it really won't matter. The word is the word, the spirit is the spirit, and the voice of God is just alive, powerful, and well here today as anywhere, anytime. Where two or more are gathered in his name, around his word, submitted to it, you can't ask for more power than this. This is your day. He came from heaven to earth humbly that he might receive us where we are to lead him to where he is. So don't underestimate his coming. Uh, Nathaniel did, and we will too if we're not careful. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He saw the good mixed with the bad. He said that doubt was really kind of you know, cynical, but you know what? At least you're a truth teller. You, know, you, you didn't want to come to a guy that wasn't real. That discernment is going to serve you later when we get you cleaned up a little bit. And then and Nathanael said in his doubting way, Well, how do you know me? He, and Jesus answered, and I can only imagine what this meant because it had meaning beyond the, the, the page. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And with all my heart, I believe that he was praying. With all my heart, I believe that he was sitting under that fig tree and he was somehow acknowledging God and he was talking to God and he was saying, if you're real, I mean, I have given up my job. I've started listening to this crazy man, John the Baptist. And I have these messianic expectations, and you're nowhere here. It's almost like the Spirit of God was prompting the doubt. And if this ain't real, I won't know part of it. If it's real, you show up and you tell me now. And then he shows up, and he says, I saw you when you were praying. 
I was the one you were praying to. And I'm not up there. Right now, I'm down here, and I'm coming to you to let you know I am here. Immediately, Nathaniel declared. This t- I mean, he could have seen him because he went around the other way. Clearly, something powerful very, beyond uh, the page happened because N- Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Like, immediately, the doubter became a believer. What a, what a powerful thing, indeed. Jesus saw Nathaniel, and he saw him through the corridor of time, and he said, this is a man that one day, uh, not, not even in heaven, but before heaven, on earth before that, he is going to be a man of incredible discernment. And unlike Jacob, who was a deceiver, he is going to be Israel, um, a man of God with a circumcised heart, sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He perceived the transformation in him as well, and he let Philip know, this isn't you seeking me, this is me seeking you. And that is a a seeking that continues to us to this day. In verse 50, in closing it out, Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. And then he said, You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now we know that this is actually literally true. A few of his disciples, I don't know that Philip was there, but a few of his disciples uh, saw the transfiguration just before Christ died and um, was resurrected and ascended into heaven. He had this moment of, of transfiguration and a few of his people were around him and he was on this mountain and all of a sudden uh, heaven kind of opened up and he shone brightly and Moses was there and Elijah was there and the voice of the Father was there and the Holy Spirit was there and they marveled and they saw kind of this portal from heaven to earth coming through Christ but I believe that it's even more important than that I think this is a metaphor for transcendence in general and, and this is Jesus saying this is me coming to you where you are and, and the Holy Spirit coming and seeking you but I'm, I'm going to do something you wouldn't even believe. I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to so capture you that at some point in the future, you're not, you're not just going to be down here, but through me, you're going to be transported into heaven. And don't you know that when we come to Christ at the cross and we say, Jesus, I believe you are who you said you are. You died on the cross for my sins. You have washed me clean by your blood. You are the Lamb of God who takes away not just the sins of the world, but my sins. And, and not only were you good like that, but you continue to have a good will for me. And so when we come to the cross and we close our eyes and we imagine and we receive his grace there, and then he allows us, because our conscience has been sprinkled with the blood, to rush into his pleasant presence at his throne. Don't you know that when we bow our heads here this morning and see Christ seated on his throne, that though it is symbolic and, yes, it is our imagination, spiritually it is very real. And I go back to the beginning again and I remind you that this Savior is a king. And he is so powerful. He can do anything at any time, anywhere he wants it. He doesn't do what I want, but he does what he wants whenever he wants to. And he saves marriages and he heals cancer. He gives, he gives peace on a deathbed to someone who gives their life to him so they can go to be with him forever. He restores finances, but more important than that, he restores you. He says, I'll give you a blessing that, that, you, that there is no room to contain. I'll give you so much of a blessing that whatever the circumstances are around you, you can laugh at the days to come. I mean, he can do anything. So, if you're convinced that God is good, that Jesus took away your sins, not only that he is good and, and that he is good as a Savior, but he is good as a Lord, and he is here to administer his good, pleasing, and perfect will for you, the very best for you and your family. If you are convinced that he is good, and you want this peace that surpasses all understanding, and you want power, and you want creative energy, and you want to be able to see the world as he does, and you want to wake up tomorrow morning not afraid anymore, If you want this life and life more abundantly that he clearly did not come to bring us eternally but on earth as it shall be. If you're convinced that he is good and you want this eternal life even right now then I would say to you what he would say to you which is to follow him. Lock your eyes on Jesus. Hone into his word. Surrender your heart to him. Hear what he has to say and follow him at all costs because as he said to them he says to us today you ain't seen nothing yet. And I believe with all my heart, that's the word of God for me and for you. And whoever has ears to hear it and a heart to receive it and believe it 
will absolutely be received by him to the exclusion of none.